Laughter One of the most prevalent and most important forms of non-verbal communication that can be seen within our species. Laughter is universal. It can be found across all languages, all cultures, and across all ages. Laughter starts early, already as infants, and it continues throughout our lifespan. Because laughter is so ubiquitous, an important question to then ask is, why do we laugh? This question, and so much more, will be addressed in this video. Welcome to Sight. Before we attempt to answer the question, why we laugh, it can be a good idea to first take a look at what laughter is. Now, this may seem like a silly question because of course we know what laughter is. But still, I think it can be interesting to at least take a look at what laughter really is from a more detailed point of view. Laughter is a non-verbal vocalization that resembles primitive cries, calls and other sounds more than it does human speech. This distinction between laughter and language as two separate things is supported by the notion that laughter is typically under weaker voluntary control than language is. While some people can produce laughter voluntarily that sound pretty convincing, most voluntary laughter sound like a poor imitation. So, if laughter is not language, what is it? Well, spectrographic analysis show that laughter is composed of a series of short voiced notes that are each about 75 milliseconds long. These voiced notes are repeated at regular intervals of about 210 milliseconds. Each of these laugh notes has a strong harmonic structure. It is the harmonic structure of the left notes and the duration of the notes and the internode intervals that define laughter. Altering the duration of the internode intervals will influence whether laughs are perceived as spontaneous, voluntary and human, or non-human. Let's take a look at the following graph that shows the frequency spectra of human and chimpanzee laughter. In the upper part of this graph, we see the sharp onsets and offsets and strong harmonic structure of human laughter. At the bottom of the graph, you see chimpanzee laughter that lacks the comparable harmonic structure that humans have. Another difference between the two is that human laughter is voiced, whereas chimpanzee laughter is unvoiced. Because of these differences, we can easily distinguish between human laughter and this laughter-like sound that chimps make. The way that laughter sounds does not only differ between species. There is a huge variation in the way that laughter sounds within humans. For instance, some people laugh like this. <laughs> and then there are some people that laugh like this. <laughs> the question then is, how are we able to recognize all of these different ways of laughing as laughter? An answer to this question lies in the neuromuscular constraints of our vocal apparatus. Because of these constraints, there is some underlying similarity between the laughter of all of us. If there were no such underlying similarity in our laughter, we would not be able to identify the vocalization as laughter. Now that we have briefly addressed what laughter is, let's take a look at why we laugh. Now this is not an easy question to answer. There are several theories about why we laugh, and some of these theories go way back. The first theory that we'll discuss is the superiority theory. This theory has its roots from Plato, and this theory dominated Western thinking for almost 2000 years. This theory articulates the view 
that laughter expresses feelings of superiority over others or over a former state of ourselves. An example of this is the concept of Schadenfreude. Now, I'm sorry if I butcher the pronunciation of this word. German is not my native language, but I think most of you are familiar with this concept. Schadenfreude, or Skadegladje, as it is in Swedish, refers to the joy that we feel over other people's misfortune. An example of laughter arising from Schadenfreude is seeing a friend of ours fall in a funny way. One argument in favor of the superiority theory is that people dislike being laughed at and that this must be because laughter devalues the object in the subject's eyes. Despite this argument in favor of the superiority theory, the theory started to lose its dominance in the 1700s. This happened following the critique that feelings of superiority are neither necessary nor sufficient for laughter. There are plenty of situations in which we can laugh without feelings of superiority being present. This is for instance true when we hear a funny story. As the superiority theory lost its dominance, one theory that emerged is the relief theory. This theory argues that laughter releases nervous energy. In this sense, laughter is considered a homeostatic mechanism by which psychological tension is reduced. One proponent of this theory is our good old friend Sigmund Freud. Freud argued that jokes, just like dreams, are related to unconscious content. Specifically, Freud argued that dreams are the result of pre-conscious desires and impulses that we have repressed during the waking hours of our day. These repressed desires and impulses are then manifested as dreams when we sleep as to be able to stay asleep without being disturbed by the true material that is being processed. In this sense, our unconscious is disguising our repressed desires and impulses as dreams, which are more easily digestible by our consciousness. In a similar vein, Freud also argued that jokes are a way for us to disguise repressed impulses and desires. By telling a joke, we're able to transform the repressed socially unacceptable impulses and emotions like obscenity and aggression into pleasurable ones such as laughter. Another theory that emerged around the same time as the relief theory did is the incongruency theory. This theory states that laughter stems from the humor that arises from the realization that our mental expectations about something has been violated. In other words, it arises with the realization that there is an incongruence between our expectation and reality. An example of this is the joke, why do birds fly south in the winter? Because it's too far to walk. This joke works because the punchline conflicts with the initial interpretation of the setup. The initial interpretation of the setup is why do the birds fly south for the winter and not north or west or even east. When the punchline comes in, there is an incongruence between this initial interpretation of the setup and the punchline. This incongruence is resolved once the setup is reinterpreted as why do the birds fly south in the winter. According to this theory, this is when laughter occurs. Thus far, we have discussed three different theories on why we laugh. The superiority theory, the relief theory, and the incongruency theory. While these theories all come from a more psychological or philosophical perspective, there's another theory on why we laugh that takes a more evolutionary perspective. This theory is known as the social bonding theory. The social bonding theory argues that laughter 
is first and foremost a means for social bonding and as a way of communicating with each other in order to change the behavior of others. In this sense, laughter is more than just a series of vocalizations and facial movements that are made in conjunctions with feelings of superiority, relief, or resolved incongruence. It is a means for us to engage in nonverbal communication with each other. This theory is supported by several different findings. For instance, research shows that we are 30 times more likely to laugh when we are around other people as compared to when we are alone. Furthermore, research also shows that we are more likely to laugh around people that we know as compared to when we are with people that we don't know. This shows the importance of laughter as a bonding tool. The hypothesis that laughter serves as a mean of strengthening social bonds makes sense from an evolutionary perspective. In primates, we see social grooming as a means of strengthening the social bonds among them. However, because our social networks have grown a lot over time, Laughter may very well be used by the modern human as a replacement for grooming to strengthen the bonds we have with each other. This notion was supported by a study conducted in 2017 by researchers Manninen et al. This study found that laughing together with your close friends led to increased pleasurable sensations as well as increased endogenous opioid release in the thalamus caudate nucleus and the anterior insula as compared to laughing alone. The effect of social laughter on the endogenous opioid release in the brain was argued to potentially be involved in the formation, reinforcement and the maintenance of human social bonds. In this video we have briefly discussed what laughter is and different theories on why we laugh. The things we discussed in this video barely scratches the surface of what there is to know about laughter. Still, we hope that you have enjoyed this video and that you've hopefully learned something as well. If you did enjoy this video, please consider dropping us a like and subscribing to the channel. Don't forget to ring that notification bell and we'll see you in the next video.